أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى فرج وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائم على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين for the love of our beloved Prophet and his beloved progeny, please recite a second loud salawat. For the hastening in the return of our beloved 12th Imam, please recite a third loud salawat. The topic that we intend to discuss tonight, inshallah, is the topic of thought and contemplation. This is something that we find the importance of discussing today. Today, you might be sitting in your living room, in your bedroom. You might be watching this website or that website. Sometimes when you go to the computer, you might be neutral about something. You may not even have an opinion regarding a certain movement, a certain campaign. And in the matter of five seconds, 10 seconds, you see a clip, you see a video, you see a post. All of a sudden you go from being neutral to being a campaign, a part of this campaign, for example. Being a fan of this campaign. Bearing the flag of this movement, for example. Why? What changed? Did anything around you change? Did the environment around you change? No. The only thing that changed in those seconds were your thought process. Today, even more so with the rise of social media, you find that this thought process has become so critical and it drives exactly what you will do outwardly. Whatever you are thinking inside, that's what will show outside. We were surprised just a couple years ago, these past four or five years, that this phenomenon, and I call it a phenomenon because it's truly something to be studied, this phenomenon that we call Daesh or ISIS or whatever they want to call it, it was really surprising sometimes you would hear in the news that young men and women living in some of the most convenient countries in the world, some of the most, the easiest places to live on earth here in the United States, a, a little less here, but maybe more in Europe, for example, you would hear that this young man or this young woman or this man with his whole family, he's getting up. He's setting aside all of the comforts in living in this European country, for example. And he's traveling thousands of miles to go where? To go and live in the middle of a battlefield. To go and join a group that does some horrific things. You think to yourself for your second, you said, how on earth does a man or a woman at that age where they're supposed to try to take pleasure from their world how, what, what changes that this person is willing to leave everything behind and go into a country that is chaos and war and disorder? What happens? It's the thought process, brothers and sisters. Because someone has been working on the thought process of this individual. Nothing around him has changed. No, he's just watching a clip. A small piece of information is being added to his thought process. He digests this through his thought process, and all of a sudden you see the actions that this person is doing. Instead of helping humanity, now he's doing the most horrific things against humanity. This is the power that the thought process has. Recite a salawat, please. We understand this even more today. There was an interesting study that was done in the UK, in Britain. The study was a very simple example, a simple question. The question was this. They would go up to the average British person and they would ask this British person, what percentage of your population is Muslim? They put that question in front of us. We might say 10%. We might say something in that area. These, the, pers the people who carried out the study, they say on average people's answer was around 20%. 20% means what? Practically speaking, 20% means that out of every five people that you see, one of them is what? 
is Muslim, is that the truth of the matter? Or is this someone playing with the thought process of these individuals? You go, you look at the statistics, you find that the percentage of Muslims, for example, in this particular country, when it comes to Britain, for example, is less than 5%. But the thought process has been influenced to a point where this person, they say Muslim, he feels like Muslims are coming, they're taking over. He says, no, 20, 25%. They must be a lot more than what it is. This is the importance of the thought process. Knowing this, Islam has not disregarded the importance of thought and contemplation one bit. This is one of those fundamental principles that you can tell the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt every step of the way they were trying to instill this idea, this concept into the minds of their believers. Recite a salawat please. So when you go to the words of the Ahlul Bayt, sometimes they will use this phrase. They will say, لَيْسَتِ الْعِبَادَةُ كَثْرَةُ الصَّامِ وَالصَّلَاةِ Ibadah, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the highest levels is not you praying all day. Then what am I supposed to do? إِنَّمَا الْعِبَادَةُ كَثْرَةُ التَّفَكُّرْ فِي أَمْرِ اللَّهِ it's about thought, it's about contemplation. If you have the right thought, the right contemplation, the salat and psalm will follow, those will come. The key is you coming to an understanding, the key is your thought process. Okay, we have many ahadith in this regard. When you go to, for example, the sixth imam, the sixth imam adds, he says, Afdal al idmanu tafakkur fi Allah. You're supposed to think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This part we understand, brothers and sisters. This part is the introductory part. This is not what we're trying to get to today. The question that we want to answer, and we will carry on with this question throughout the discussion, is this. When our Ahlul Bayt say that you're supposed to think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what exactly are we supposed to be sitting down and thinking about? If I come to you and I say, you know, out of your 24 hours that you are living your life, eight hours you're asleep, in the rest of your time, think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I just throw something as vague as that in front of you, the moment you sit down to think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your mind goes to a million directions. You don't even know what you're supposed to think about. What do we mean? We say, tafakkur fi amrullah. What is amrullah? What did the Ahlul Bayt tell us to think about? I know I'm supposed to enhance this idea of thought and contemplation, but about what? What am I supposed to think about? This is a question that the Ahlul Bayt have also provided answers for. And inshallah tonight we're going to talk about two of these things that the Ahlul Bayt in particular have told us. You want to think, this, you want to use this tool of contemplation, this is what you're supposed to be thinking about. Recite a salawat please. One of the ashab of the sixth imam came to him. He says, I asked the sixth imam, Sa'altu Abu Abdullah, Amma Yarwin Nas. I asked him about this hadith that people keep saying left and right. What is this hadith? Hadith says that if you take a little bit of time to think and contemplate, it's better for you than staying up all night and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, I asked him, I said, this hadith that they say, is this a hadith? He said, yes, this is a hadith. But then he asks a very important question. He says, What is he supposed to think about? When you guys keep saying, think, what exactly is he supposed to think about? This, in this hadith, the imam mentions one of the things that we're supposed to think about, brothers and sisters. He says, listen, sometimes you might be passing by a place in today's day and age. You're in your car, you're driving, the GPS is on, you're going. Sometimes as you're driving down the road, you see a house, a place, a factory, a corporate building sometimes that is now abandoned. It's now ruins. No one comes there. You know before this was a big place, but now it's nothing. He passes by a place that's just ruins. Okay, what am I supposed to think about? The Imam says it's very simple. You're supposed to ask yourself this question. Where are those people who used to live here? Where are those people who built you and sold you for millions of dollars? Where are they now? What is the Imam referring to here, brothers and sisters? He is saying that one of the things that we're supposed to think about is our place 
in history. Where do we stand in history? You need to understand that we stand in a place where millions of people have come before us, millions of people have come after us. So what? What does that mean? That means that everything that you are experiencing, millions of people have gone through the same thing that you are going through. And millions of people will go through the same thing that you're going through right now in the future. Why is that important? Because when you understand that, brothers and sisters, neither do the highs of life intoxicate you and you forget about everything, nor do the lows of life disappoint you and take away all of your hope. You understand this difficulty that I'm dealing with. My grandfather dealt with the same thing. Now it's over. Time passes by very quickly. This is a very important thing to understand. Recite a salawat, please. This is why we have hadith. The hadith says, Al baliyatu idha ammat sahulat. When you know that what you're dealing with is something that thousands of people have already dealt with, it becomes a little bit easier for you. Now, Islam is not a religion of fantasy, brothers and sisters. It's a practical religion. Meaning what? Islam is not here to take away all difficulty from our life. What Shaykh is saying that you close your mind for a second. You understand that there were people before you and then all of a sudden everything is fine. Is that what we're saying? Of course not. Recite a salawat, please. Islam is not a religion of fantasy. Islam is not here to make our lives empty of difficulty. No, Islam does not even make such a claim. Islam simply says, I want to make your life a little bit more tolerable. That's what Islam, that's what we should expect of Islam, brothers and sisters. Someone else goes through difficulties, they lose it goes into depression, they might commit suicide. You're a Muslim, life is a little bit more tolerable for you. That's how much we should expect from Islam. So when you see that thousands of people have dealt with the same thing, you can put things into perspective. You don't lose your mind over the smallest thing. Allow me to go through an example of this that relates to our lives today. Sometimes a young brother, a young sister, they get to know each other, they're interested in one another, they start to develop feelings and emotions. When these feelings and emotions start to develop, all of a sudden you see this young man, this young woman, they act in such a way, it's as if they're the first person ever who's experiencing these emotions. And the parents come to them, they say, listen, <laughs> We used to feel the same way. Your grandfather, your grandmother, they used to feel the same way. No, he doesn't understand. Why? Because he doesn't understand his place in history. He doesn't understand thousands of people have felt the same exact emotion. So what happens? He loses it. He starts making decisions based on emotions and feelings. And then the problem that we have is that the culture here and the society here feeds into this mindset. You see, movies, shows, the whole idea is the emotions that this person has about someone from the opposite gender. Islam, how much importance has Islam given to this issue? Very little. You go, you look in Islam, for example, we have speakers sometimes. They want to speak on this issue. You go, you look at Islam, you see you're looking for, uh, uh, searching the word love in our ahadith. You don't really find it that much, this type of love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of it sometimes. He says, yes, when you get married, we place this mawadda for you. Later on, that mawadda turns into rahmah. Ya Allah, tell me about what I'm going to feel. No, he's not too worried, he's not too concerned about that. Our ahadith don't speak of this idea of love and ishq in detail, no. Yes, we have some ahadith. They say you fall in love, just watch, you don't do something that's not modest, for example. Do they give this much importance to something like this? No, this is something that you're feeling thousands of people before you felt it. Forgive me, but sometimes animals might have this type of approach as well. It's a tool, you use this tool, to be able to compromise in a mutual life. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing two people who do not understand anything in the same way together. The brothers on this side of the curtain, 
we definitely see things very differently from the sisters on this side of the curtain. I don't think anyone on this side of the curtain truly understands the thought process of anyone on this side of the curtain. That's the truth of the matter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings these two together. How does he do that? Emotions and feelings. If he doesn't drop that little bit of magic, then of course we won't be able to live together. He's bringing two totally different, I would call them species, two different species together. How does he do that? A little bit of it was with these emotions. Islam gives a little bit of importance to this issue. Whereas you find the society here, the ideology is what? Your whole life is defined by these emotions and feelings. No. Why is this? Because the youth in this society, they do not understand their place in society, in history. They don't understand that all these people before them had the same dreams, the same desires, the same happiness that they feel right now. They had it and it passed. The griefs in this world, they had it and it passed as well. Recite a salawat, please. Once we understand this, brothers and sisters, then another thing that happens to us is that the attention of other people, the attention that they give us, it becomes less important for us in our lives. Today, again, you find people will take the social media for a couple of clicks, for a couple of likes, this person will go out there and embarrass family members, friends, spouses, anyone and anything. For what? So that people can pay attention to me for a little while. Well, there were people before you 50 years ago, they did the same thing. You don't even remember their names. If I ask you, brothers and sisters, if we're talking about people who left a mark on this world, forget about these people that they introduced to us here, Steve Jobs. Who's Steve Jobs? People who left a mark on this world, you don't even remember their names. Like the seven wonders. If I ask this brother here, the seven wonders, what are the seven wonders and who created them? I can promise you, he won't get past the pyramids in Egypt. This thing, these things pass by. How are you able to understand this when you have that moment of thoughts and you pass by those ruins and you say, Aina sakinuki, Aina banuki. When you understand your place in history. Recite a salawat, please. So we find this is one of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us to think about. Let's move on to a second thing, something that the Qur'an has addressed multiple times. And that is thinking and contemplating about the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First, I need to mention this point. Whenever we get to this point, I remember even I was guilty of this early on in my Hawza studies. I was very guilty of this. If a shaykh or a maulana or a sayyid were to speak about the God's creation, for example, this animal, that animal, you would say, we didn't come here for this. Tell us about the high level stuff. What do you mean God's creation? But you find someone like Imam Khomeini, this is just a point on the side. Someone like Imam Khomeini in his book, the 40 Hadith book, he goes on for two pages just explaining about the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He explains the position of the moon, the position of the sun, how all of this is created so that we can live our lives. This is an arif that's speaking about this. So just a point on the side as we go through this, this is not something that we only use for our five-year-old child. That our five-year-old child comes to us, Baba, does God exist? Yes, Baba. Look at this tree. This tree must have had a creator. Oh, Baba, I understand now. This is not... This is not the only purpose that we think about the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's far deeper, far more sophisticated than this. This is why Imam Khomeini says in Arif, he is not mustaghni. He is in need of thinking about this. This is the second thing that the Ahlul Bayt have taught us that we are supposed to contemplate and think about. Recite a salawat, please. Allahumma <laughs> salam. So when we come to this point, you find the Qur'an takes two approaches when it comes to encouraging us to contemplate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will sit there and just, He will generally point to His creation and He will say, take a look at my creation and learn. You have a doubt, you're looking for a flaw, go and look again. 
But I'm telling you, if you go and you look, as much as you try to look, you won't find a flaw there. You'll just come back all tired with no results. Sometimes he'll tell us something like this in general. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala singles out certain things. And when he singles out these particular things, you know this particular thing is very important. The sophistication that you find in this, the complexity that you find in this phenomenon that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is singling out, this is something else. This is why sometimes in the Quran we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, we created this. Sometimes he says, He is the one who created this. Sometimes he says, this work is so majestic, I'm not even going to share my majesty with anyone regarding this one. For example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates the human being, he doesn't say, oh, we created this. No, he takes all the credit for himself. He says, فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ he speaks of himself in the third person. He says, Allah, what a masterpiece did you just create? So when we go to these certain phenomena in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has singled them out, we know something special is going on here. The problem is sometimes these phenomena, they take place so often in our lives, we find them as ordinary. So what does the Qur'an do? The Qur'an just comes, he explains things a little bit, he puts things into perspective, and then that thing that was ordinary for you turns into something that is extraordinary now. One of these is what we drink from the cattle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts, he says, وَإِنَّ لَكُمْ فِي الْأَنْعَامِ لَعِبْرَةً there is a lesson in the cattle for you to learn. And you sit there and you say, Ya Allah, what do you want me to learn from the cattle? The cattle are dirty and they are filthy. And you know what he says? He says, I agree with you. Because he has a point he wants to make. He says, I agree with you. Animals are dirty. <laughs> they are filthy. But that's exactly my point. Say, so what is your point? He continues, he says, Nusqikum mimma fi butunih. You know this cattle that you find dirty and filthy? We take the things that remain in the stomach of this animal, we let, them, we let you drink it, and you take it, something you call milk. Say, so yes, Allah, that's ordinary. I bought milk this morning. I had cereal and milk this morning. He says, oh, because you never paid attention to the process. And in one small phrase, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains this process that we don't even pay attention to. Recite a salawat, please. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you said animals are dirty and filthy. Correct? You say they're dirty and filthy. He says, listen, what I do when I want to create this liquid that we call milk, I do something spectacular. Amongst all of the filth that you find in the body of this animal, I bring about this pure milk. You say, how is that? He says, let me tell you what goes on in the body of this animal. When this animal eats its food, the waste remains in the body of the animal before it is disposed. On one hand, you have waste, which is filthy and dirty. On the other hand, you have what? You have the blood of this animal, which is filthy and dirty. Min bayni farthin wa damin. In the middle of all of this chaos, what is it that I do? I bring out this pure milk that you drink. Sa'igan lishsharabin. When you drink it, you love it. Then you sit back and you understand. And this is just the beginning, brothers and sisters. Then you sit back and you understand that this small, ordinary thing that you looked at, you saw it's milk. Then you understand it's not ordinary. The body of this animal, which you won't even touch. If you see the animal that they got the milk from, you won't even drink milk that way. That day you will not even touch the milk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is what I do. From the midst of all of this chaos and filth, I bring about this milk. مِن بَيْنِ فَرْثٍ وَدَمٍ لَبِنًا خَالِصًا سَائِغًا لِلشَّارِبِينَ You drink it and you love it. You don't even know where this has 
come from. This is just one of the phenomena that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of in the Quran. So to wrap up the second point, this is the second thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to contemplate his creation. And if we have these moments of, create, of, of contemplation, brothers and sisters, you will find that many times it will help us much more than this ibadat and that ibadat. The ibadat that is wajib is absolutely necessary. But you want to add something to it today? You add a little bit of tafakkur. Some of our ulama, what they used to do after their salat was this. They would sit, they do tasbihat of Layla Fatimah al Zahra. When they're done, what do they do? Half a minute, two minutes, three minutes. Just think. Think about your place in history. Think about the opportunity you have. Think about the fact that you have 30 years of life to build a future that will never end. Adding this little bit of thought that can, by the way, can come to us at any given moment. You might be driving, like the Imam said, Yamurru bil kharba. You're just driving. That moment of thought, brothers and sisters, is very valuable. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us the chance, the opportunity, the tawfiq to employ this tool of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to better ourselves, inshallah. With that, we will bring today's talk to an end. And before we end and we prepare ourselves to hear the musibah of Abu Abdullah, we will send our salams to the plain of Karbala. Assalamu alayka ya Abu Abdullah wa ala al arwah allati hallat bi fina'ik. عليك مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين ورحمة الله وبركاته